for those who are just join, new to us, we are a, a membership organization, a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we're working for fast, frequent, and dependable trains across the country and believe that we're going to need an integrated network with a lot of high speed lines going uh, 186 miles an hour and faster. Um, and so we really thank you, Congressman, for, for focusing on that. Uh, we started in 1993, and that year trains started running at 186 miles an hour across the Spanish Plateau. And it's been frustrating that we haven't made much progress since then, but uh, we have, uh, as uh, through our members, um, have had some significant progress in terms of improving Amtrak service, getting high-speed rail planning started in the Midwest, and, and other things. Um, we also believe that there's going to be a lot of mixed use lines upgrading existing freight lines uh, to connect with those high speed lines. Um, and in your proposals, you would call that uh, higher speed rail. And we appreciate that. Um, and we want to emphasize that at this point, there are two things happening at the same time. One is the appropriation for 2021, um, and 2021 starts on October 1st. Um, and the other is the authorization, the multi-year authorization, which sets the policies um, going forward. And technically that current authorization needs to be renewed by October 1st. Not really sure either of those will happen in the next few weeks, uh, but a critical short-term issue is ensuring that Amtrak doesn't go through with its plans um, to cut it's basically core routes. Um, and this is the data I wanted to make sure you were aware of um, in terms of this really important issue. I've always personally believed that the long distance trains were actually the foundation upon what we built other things because they are national, because the problems that we have with them in terms of, of uh, getting them to run on time um, and attracting more passengers um, are the same problems we'll have with any mixed use line. So as might as well share it, fix the problems all at once. Uh, but in this time of COVID, um, the tables have really turned. So Amtrak is having some serious financial troubles because of a dramatic reduction in ridership. And you can see in the Northeast quarter, which is critical to the nation's economy, um, and we need to really ramp up the investments there. Uh, but its ridership is way down, only 13% in July over 2015, uh, with the state-supported trains being in the same ballpark. But the long-distance trains have performed pretty well, considering, um, and especially in the private rooms. Uh, and so this is really where a, a success story, and it also demonstrates how important these trains are to um, uh, the rest of the country outside of the Northeast Corridor. Um, so in terms of retaining ridership, the long distance trains have done very well. Um, in terms of revenue, on the left hand side, you've got uh, last year, 2015, with the red being the long distance. Um, and this year in July, uh, the long distance trains were bringing in the bulk of their ticket revenue, uh, which again provides this base upon which to build and demonstrates that this is a very very important service um, and they've also done very well in terms of another very important productivity measurement which is the average number of people on a train every mile that that train is running passenger miles per train mile um, they performed very well in this category in in june of 2019 um, and they're also doing very well in this category in june of 20. Um, but unfortunately, Amtrak's decision to slice these from daily down to three days a week will mean that people won't even be able to ride these trains. Um, and I think it's kind of insulting to what, what I think some folks would consider flyover country to think that um, folks are flexible enough in our part of the world that they can train, you know, we can wait a day to travel. Um, really, that's not true, and we need to keep these going. So I want to thank you, Congressman, for leading a letter um, that was um, requesting that 
the 2021 appropriation and emergency funding. Um, both have emergency funding for transit, uh, but also for Amtrak. Um, and and ask that you, you know that our members, those who are listening right now, continue to ask their senators to make sure that Amtrak is funded with the emergency funding they need, plus a very specific line item that says they have to run all routes daily. So that's a quick overview. Um, i give you the opportunity again. We really appreciate you being here. Glad to see that someone who has been working at a, a high-speed railroad um, is in a position to be a champion in Congress. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to share your views today. Thank you. Greg, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, I, I think I'm also the only member of Congress who actually has a railroad retirement account. So um, I've got a little bit of of background, spent a little bit of time on a track crew uh, growing up and kind of understand this uh, business at a couple of different levels. Um, but look, I'm, I'm supporting um, this proposal uh, because it just makes sense, um, because the economics are very clear here. Uh, I, um, I, myself, I, I'm not opposed to flying or driving. I fly home to Boston uh, every time I go down to Washington, D.C. But I also recognize that anywhere else in the world, that would be an hour and a half, two hour trip on a high speed, on a high speed train that leaves every 15 minutes and it doesn't get delayed because of thunderstorms, which happens to just about every flight I take in the summer, just between Boston and Washington. So what a lot of Americans don't realize is we are not living as well. We are not as productive a society, a community, an economy, because we don't have transportation options. And if we just simply leveled the playing field and gave high-speed rail a chance to compete against the other modes, then we'd see high-speed rail doing really well. Now, there's a very good argument that because high-speed rail is better for the environment, it's better, better for public safety, it's better for economic development because it's so supportive of downtown communities. It simply is more efficient because it's faster. Those are all reasons that we should actually turn the tables and subsidize high-speed rail much more than we subsidize driving or, fl or flying. I'm not even asking for that. I'm saying let's just level the playing field and start making economic business-based decisions about how we invest in our transportation future. So let me just outline a few things that my, um, that my proposal does. First of all, it creates flexibility in how projects are financed, allowing private firms to partner with local, state, and federal governments to de develop a high-speed rail network. This is important because, frankly, there's not enough funding right now um, in the federal government or in state government to develop high-speed rail. But because it makes so much sense economically, because it makes business sense, there are private firms that want to invest in lines. So we need to take advantage and, of that and develop and support public-private partnerships um, to leverage both sides of that equation um, to get this done. And uh, we can talk a little bit in more detail about, about how this works, but one of the things that we have to do is, is just kind of adjust the laws, the funding laws, to say that um, you, know, you, can, you can meet funding requirements by using both public and private money together, and that makes it easier to access certain loan programs and grant programs uh, through the Federal Railroad Administration um, and the Department of Transportation. I also call for significant upfront federal investment in high-speed rail. I've said 205 billion over five years. Again, would love to have that higher. It makes sense for it to be higher, uh, but we thought that that's a good place to, uh, to start. I, I think it's important to, to say that, you know, um, we have never had this kind of investment in high-speed rail in our nation's history, but we certainly have had it in our airline system and in our highway system. In fact, we've seen much more than that. Um, so again, let's level the playing field, let free competition have a say here, and give people the freedom to choose how they get to work. Um, the FRA would also need to establish comprehensive regulations for high-speed rail. And, and Rick, this gets to one of the points that you led with, which is that it's not enough just to have disparate, you know, separate, independent um, private 
uh, high-speed rail operations around the country that are not interoperable and can't connect. Because one of the things that you learn about high-speed rail, and I'm sure most of you on this webinar already know, is that the sweet spot for high-speed rail is between 500 and, and 1,000 miles. In fact, they used to say uh, it was 500 miles. It's kind of prepped up to 750 as speeds increase and delays on our highways and, uh, well, spe specifically our, our, our airports increase. Um, that means that 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 sweet spot for high-speed rail is expanding. It's getting it's getting bigger. But if you look around the country, there are a lot of 500, 750 mile uh, corridors where high-speed rail makes sense. The Midwest, out of Chicago, is one of them also in the Northeast, also in the Southeast, the Pacific Northwest, and, um, and increasingly now the Southwest, because there's been so uh, many people moving to the Southwestern part of our country. And you might think of those as all independent, but when you start putting them on a map, you recognize that these circles are contiguous, they connect. And we're missing a huge opportunity if we don't realize that, you know, while a lot of people won't take a train from Chicago to LA, most likely people on that route are mostly still going to fly. There are a lot of intermediate routes on that corridor where people will want to travel. And by the way, if you build all of those routes and they're actually interconnected, then you also have a high-speed freight system, which could be essential uh, revenue uh, for, for this uh, nationwide high-speed rail network. So there are a lot of reasons why, to Rick's point, you have to have a system that's interoperable, and you also need to, you know, preserve these long distance routes in the, in the interim so that all the states recognize that they have a stake in high speed rail as well. It's not just a California and a Northeastern thing, or a California, Northeastern, and Florida thing, or a California, Northeast, and Florida, and Chicago thing, all right? This is something that every state should have a stake in. That's one of the reasons why the interstate highway system was so successful. By some measures, they should have never built an interstate across Wyoming because the existing road there was perfectly sufficient for the amount of traffic. Uh, but they got political buy-in um, for the whole system by promising Wyoming that they would get a piece as well. And by the way, there have been some real benefits for Wyoming. So. Um, that's where we're coming from. Uh, that's the approach I take. And uh, Rick, do we are we able to take questions here? We're glad to to have a bit of a back and forth here, so that uh, so that people can can chime in here, or, or you can ask me questions. But well, so um, uh, Bill Porter, one of our board members, is asking how many co-sponsors you have for your legislation, but I don't think you've actually introduced it yet. So if you could talk about what your plan is with the, the actual how the yes. legislation gets introduced, et cetera. That's right. So I haven't introduced it yet, but we don't have any co-sponsors. Um, what I'm doing right now is I'm shopping it around to um, influential people like the chair of the Transportation Committee, um, the chair of uh, the, um, uh, the Transportation Subcommittee of the House Appropriations Committee, um, the two people who are competing to be chairs of the, uh, of the Appropriations Committee because the current chair is stepping down, um, to, to, to both you know, um, encourage their support, but also get their feedback on the proposal. I can tell you that so far it's been very positive. Uh, the feedback has been uh, tremendous, um, but I'm never one who thinks that I know everything and I get it right in the first try. So we're really trying to uh, get uh, a, a broad group of uh, stakeholder input, including from colleagues in Congress. And when we feel that we have a more refined piece of legislation um, with a lot of buy-in, then we'll introduce it. So what can we help at, at this stage? How can we help move this process forward? Well, uh, one of the things you can do is you can learn more about the proposal, um, give me and my team direct feedback, but then share it with your representatives, especially in key corridors where this is important. So for example, there's been a lot of movement on the Pacific Northwest right now because Microsoft has actually commissioned a study. Incidentally, this is a great example of a private company stepping up where the government has failed to do its job. And we wanna be able to take advantage of that. We wanna be able to leverage Microsoft's contribution to this debate. And, um, and, and that's part of what my legislation does. But it also means that there's some momentum and the movement in the Pacific Northwest, which by the way, happens to be where Chairman Peter DeFazio of the House Transportation uh, Committee, he's from Oregon, uh, lives. 
And so if you represent a member of Congress in that community that would be served by a high-speed rail in the Pacific Northwest, make sure you get your member of Congress to sign on to this bill. Now, this applies to quarters all across the country, um, but, um, uh, but recognize that we're trying to get a broad group of stake, uh, stakeholders, uh, bipartisan uh, and nationwide, to support this legislation, uh, to show that this is not just something that you know is convenient for Congressman Moulton because he can get to Washington faster from Massachusetts. This is this is truly a national network that we're trying to build. Um, so, um, how do you see uh, the coalition in Congress building around this? What have you done any work to figure out what kind of interests need to come together to make it really move forward? Yes, we have. And we've already engaged a number of those uh, stakeholders. So for example, organized labor is very supportive of this proposal and they have a, a voice in our politics that's important. Um, and, um, and they recognize that uh, there are a lot of benefits to this proposal in um, both the construction jobs uh, and in the jobs to operate the system. And the simple fact that this is something that's, I mean, economists across the board have said, high-speed rail is good for the American economy. Um, so building high-speed rail uh, will generate more jobs uh, in the long run, not even just in construction. Uh, so organized labor is an, is an important constituent group. Uh, the environmentalists are an important constituent group. You know, high-speed rail is the only transportation system that exists today um, in widespread use that is completely carbon free. As long as you hook your system up to a carbon free electricity source, as France does, for example, where they generate most of their uh, power via nuclear, uh, they have a totally carbon free high speed transportation system. It's going to be a long time before um, we have carbon free airline transportation. And of course, we've seen how long it takes to adopt electric vehicles, even though they've been around for a while now. Um, so We've got uh, tremendous support for the environmental community, but that's also support we need to build. I mean, you know, we've got some stakeholders, we've got some groups on board, um, but we're looking to, um, to get more. Uh, there are also people from the rail community. Um, I was just on the line uh, with Siemens the other day. Uh, they are interested in this. Um, we've been in touch with uh, Texas Central, of course. Uh, I used to work there. Um, and uh, other high-speed rail projects that are being proposed across the United States. Uh, those are obvious uh, stakeholders. I'm very proud to have the support of former Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood, uh, not only because he's a former Secretary of, of Transportation, but because he's a Republican. And uh, it proves that this is a this should be a bipartisan priority. Um, have you spoken with Darren LaHood? And uh, uh, it just in my part of the world, Rodney Davis. Uh, uh, so um, so I've, I've mentioned it to Rodney Davis. You know, all this is a little bit harder because we've introduced this since um, we're not in Washington hardly at all, and so we don't get to see these folks. Uh, uh, regularly. Um, but I've mentioned it to Rodney Davis, uh, and so uh, his team should be is taking a look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've reached out to Darren. Um, you know, his dad cautioned me that he's uh, a little bit more reticent to work across the aisle. So um, he's not, not quite as uh, uh, bipartisan as his father. Um, but, um, but he has an important, he represents a real important uh, Community that would benefit tremendously uh, from uh, from from high speed rail service in the in the Midwest, and so he's a great example of a congressman that you know um, it would help us if he heard from his constituents about how important this proposal is. So the, yeah, the uh, state did an initial feasibility study for a two hundred and twenty mile an hour line, um, mm -hmm. and in that feasibility study, they took a slightly different route than the existing Amtrak route. Um, and went Champaign, Spring, Champaign Decatur, Springfield, um, which brings in another key link that's not in this network today. Uh, but certainly Springfield is both Davis and, and, uh, and LaHood. Um, so. Rick, I want to just comment on what, on what you said uh, briefly here, because there's a couple of important points tied into this. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, it is important to realize we don't have to follow existing uh, rail rights of way. Um, that often makes sense. And one of the things we've built into this proposal is a way for freight railroads to get more fairly compensated if we want to take some of their uh, right of way. Um, we want them to be enthusiastic about um, building uh, rail in America out further, building high speed rail, letting a, 
letting us catch up with the rest of the world. Um, but they, you know, they, they own this land and this, these rights of way, and they deserve to be fairly compensated. Uh, but, but it's not the only way to go. And, if, and I think that we should take a blank slate approach to this and recognize that while we may use existing railroads to get into key terminals in the cities, um, you have options to use uh, median strips of highways, um, a greenfield development, uh, power line rights of way. That's something they're looking at very closely in Texas, for example, uh, that, might, that might make more sense for future development. So, uh, you know, there are some people who think the only way to do this is if you build a track next to an existing freight rail line. And that's just simply not true. And I think that's important for people to know. And in part, our part of the world, it's actually more difficult. Because, you know, the railroad established towns every five miles and the center of town is the railroad station. So if you tried to punch a high speed rail line through the middle of that, you basically destroy that town. Uh, so th th that, you know, um, in terms of, and then you've got the example of Bright Line in, in Nevada and California where they'll be using the I-15 right away. I mean, if you just look at this around, yeah, if you look at this around the world, um, um, you know, Europe has been around a lot, a lot longer than us, right? And uh, they also have uh, existing rail lines through city centers and whatnot. And they've been really smart about using existing rights of ways in some places and then in other places creating bypasses. Uh, I think it's important that you don't avoid towns in particular because one of the virtues of rail is that you can get to downtown and serve downtowns um, uh, directly. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you need to blast through every community like you just said. And so there's real flexibility here, and we want to make sure people um, understand that. You know, one of the great problems of the interstate highway system is that it was built in a way that destroyed a lot of cities. And so don't let anyone tell you that that has to happen with high-speed rail. High-speed rail builds cities. It doesn't destroy them. Um, and the right-of-way is so much narrower. I mean, you, one high-speed rail line has the capacity of 12 highway lanes. So think about how much less destructive that is to a downtown. I mean, if you put 12 highway lanes uh, through downtown, you're dividing that city. Um, even if you had an elevated high-speed rail line, as they do in many cities, especially in Japan, uh, Japan, the Asia, they use a lot of elevated uh, lines. Um, it it complements the city. It doesn't destroy it. Absolutely. Um, so let's, uh, so Jory Sandusky is asking, uh, if you have any ideas on how we can, um, change the narrative, uh, uh, Jory believes that there's a lot of negative press and what are your ideas on how we turn that into positive press? Jory, it's a great question. I, I think the single most important thing to happen here is for America to just build one successful line. Uh, that's why I'm a big fan of the Texas project, because I think that it's in some ways, uh, not only does it make good sense economically, there'll be a lot of people who ride it, but it's relatively easy to do, relatively inexpensive. Um, so if you can get one high-speed rail line built in America, I think that'll be a game changer. Because once Americans see, wow, Americans want to ride this too. And wow, this works for American cities. And, and no, People don't refuse to ride it because they're so addicted to their cars. I mean, these are some of the myths about high-speed rail um, that perpetuate this idea that it just, just doesn't work here. Sure, it works fine in Europe, it works in uh, Japan and China, but it, but it doesn't work here. And, and this is just patently false. And I think that um, part of uh, dispelling this bad press is dispelling these myths that it doesn't, that it doesn't work here. Um, now, in the meantime, what you can do, I think, is just try to attack these myths uh, individually. And I mean, I, you know, I've had these debates with uh, with colleagues and friends for for years now, and so I I feel like I'm pretty adept at dispelling some of these arguments. But um, but I think that's one thing that's um, that's important to do. And and one of the reasons why I hope the Texas project is is successful and successful early is that one of the myths out there is that this is only good for blue states. You know, it's only the people up in the Northeast, those Democrats who like to live in cities, um, who uh, ride trains already, who will benefit from high-speed rail. Uh, if we can show that high-speed rail is successful in deep red Texas, that will completely um, dismiss that argument. And I think that that's really important. It's very sad that this has become a partisan issue. Um, it shouldn't be partisan at all. Um, and there is bipartisan support for high-speed rail, but let's be honest, it's mostly um, support on the Democratic side of the aisle, and that's one of the things we need to change to get this passed. 
Well, and that's getting back to the long distance issue. That's one of the unifying politically tool. What the long distance trains are unifying. That's right. No, if, if you can show people, I mean, I mean, I sit on the budget committee. I'm the vice chairman of the budget committee, and the ranking member, the most senior Republican, is Steve Womack from Arkansas. And we were having a debate about uh, transportation investment, and and I just, you know, just back of the envelope calculation, just showed him um, in the middle of a hearing. Uh, what, how quickly he could get to Chicago from Arkansas by high-speed rail and not have any weather delays or, 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 or anything. And, and he was like pretty taken aback because I don't think he even thought about it, didn't even realize that that was a possibility. So showing people um, in, in states across the country, um, like, you know, representatives, Republicans in Omaha, for example, you know, what a difference it would make to have high-speed rail service, not only to Chicago from Omaha, um, but west to Denver as well uh, could be quite transformational. Yeah, in uh, Arkansas, um, unfortunately, my wife insisted on taking furniture to New Orleans when we moved our son down to college a couple of weeks ago. But driving 55 and looking, you know, in your concentric circles or in con connected circles, Chicago, St. Louis, St. Louis, Memphis, Memphis, Jackson, Jackson, New Orleans. Um, and, you know, it, in the Arkansas piece of it, it was right along, you could put it right along 55 pretty easy. Um, another question, and you kind of hinted on this with the public and private match issue. Um, so Miami Orlando is under construction. Um, uh, hopefully they have that ready to go. Uh, uh, Disney, Orlando, Miami, uh, uh, pier side by the time the cruise ships start running. Uh, uh, how would this, how would you change things to make it easier for investments like that and the Victorville, Los Angeles, uh, Las Vegas service? How would your bill change that to make it easier for that private investment? So, so one of the problems right now is that there are all these stipulations for um, a certain amount of uh, state level support in order to trigger federal support. Um, without going into all the details, that's the basic problem. And what we're saying is that if you get private investors to contribute to essentially make, meet, meet that requirement for a state level match, um, then it can trigger the federal investment. Because what the, the problem is right now that, um, you know, uh, Republicans got a, uh, sorry, Florida's got a Republican governor. Um, he happens to be a super partisan uh, Trump ally. And uh, I mean, I know this, I used to serve with him in Congress. And he is likely to just play into this partisan line against high speed rail and um, say that the private developers in Florida are not going to get any support from the state. Um, and what this bill would essentially enable is for uh, the federal government to still support this effort, even if uh, the state of Florida is not playing ball. Now, we'd much rather have everybody playing ball, um, but, um, um, but that's one way it would help. We've also an, increased the private activity bond caps um, that uh, Brightline use for their fri uh, Florida line. Um, private activity bonds are one way of financing these, uh, these investments, and um, there's been a cap on them, so we're raising the cap, um, which is something that, um, that, that, uh, that certainly Brightline thinks would be incredibly helpful. In fact, we're not just raising it, we're doubling it, um, so it's a quite significant change. Um, and then uh, getting back to, oh, I wanted to point out with, uh, with the Florida project, that project was possible because Florida had done a state high-speed plan. Mm. So because they had done this plan in the 90s that said, this is how we're going to get the high-speed line into Orlando Airport, Brightline was able to take advantage of that. Um, and they also said that we're going to have a high-speed line down the middle of I-4. Um, and so they're in the process of negotiating with the state for putting it in I-4. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, Rick, just to jump in here real quick, you know, Florida, like a lot of people are moving to Florida. Um, apparently they like the sun. Um, and so, you know, this is actually a place where there shouldn't, th th these two lines could be very complementary because even if you built um, a high speed line a little bit to the west that does not go through all the downtown um, uh, city centers that the Bright Line 
uh, railroad does because it's using the existing Florida East Coast right of way. Um, you could imagine that if you want to go from you know Miami to Jacksonville on a high speed train, then you just take the 250 mile per hour high speed train um, through the through the a little bit more through the hinterlands. Um, but you could you would still want to have higher speed service, which is what Brightline is. Um, so that you can get to these intermediate communities. So that if you just want to go 50 miles north for lunch, um, that's a bright line trip. If you want to go to Jacksonville, you take the, uh, a new um, true high-speed rail line um, that would be a little bit further west. Uh, these things can be complementary. Some people are concerned in the Northeast that if you uh, turn the Northeast corridor into high-speed rail, um, well, then you'd lose service to all these communities in close coastal Connecticut. Um, as you all know, if you take the Acela, uh, from um, uh, from Boston to New York, uh, you wind through all these uh, along the coast of of, uh, of Connecticut. It's beautiful, but it's far from high speed. Um, but look, there's enough demand there to continue that service. It, it just would be more uh, higher speed intermediate service at the same time as you would build a higher speed line that probably goes a bit further west through the state. Yeah, I, a recent example for me was I wanted to get some pictures of the Italian high-speed line along the Autostrada. So I took a commuter train that runs every half hour and runs pretty fast um, out into the country and walked across some farm fields to get, get to the high-speed line. Um, and so, yes, we do need both. Um, Clark Johnson um, is asking if your bill would deal with the liability issues that and that the class ones have with running passenger trains on, on their existing lines. Yeah, I mean, so this is, um, look, this is a, <laughs> liability issues are much bigger than just uh, railroading in America, of course. And um, there are a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of, a lot of liability issues that, uh, um, that, that, that Amtrak has faced, that uh, these private companies developing high-speed rail in America um, are trying to figure out how to, um, how to navigate and how to, how to deal with. Um, and so this is something that, um, that, uh, that we're, uh, you know, we're looking at as well. And um, essentially, um, we're, we're looking at um, modeling the, the framework that, uh, that Amtrak has developed with the freight railroads um, where they have, um, it's not perfect, but they do have, you know, some, uh, they have a framework that essentially makes it uh, reasonable. But honestly, this is a place where we could probably use some more input, because I don't know that we've entirely cracked this nut um, and solved the, and solved the problem. So, um, so that's a great, uh, it's a great question. And uh, we, we're very much aware of it. Um, I don't think we have a brilliant solution in the legislation. It could be something that we could uh, work on further. Okay. Um, and, and in a similar vein, you've talked a lot about the need for st national standards. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas Central, um, if they get their rule of particular, particular applicability, um, uh, which it looks good, I, th I think they probably will fairly soon, that sets the stage for having the discussion about national standards. How does your legislation deal with, with that issue? Yeah, I, I think this is actually really essential. Um, I think this is one of the most important pieces of the legislation because, I mean, we couldn't have an interstate highway system if we didn't just have standards. I mean, you couldn't have like an interstate system where, you know, you're, you're, you're driving, um, you know, you're, 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 you're driving 75 miles an hour um, and then suddenly you cross a state line and uh, you have a, a road that's, that's only, that's only uh, you know, built for 35 miles an hour. Um, or you have lanes that are much narrower um, or whatever. So um, we had to have um, national standards for the interstate highway system. Um, we made sure that those standards were built, uh, they were future-proofed. Um, one of the things, I loved, Rick, the fact that you started this by saying 186 miles per hour or faster. Because 186 miles per hour was the standard 30 years ago. Right. This is America, folks, okay? We shouldn't be trying to be to catch up with where the world was 30 years ago, we should be building the fastest trains in the world. Um, so I actually was, I was long story, I was furious with, with, um, with some of these developers who are building 486 mile per hour maximum speed because that's so, you know, that's like if we in the 1950s looked around the country and said, well, most highways are going 40 miles an hour, so we should really engineer 
the interstate highway system to go 40 miles an hour maximum speed. That would be crazy. Of course, we didn't do that. Um, so establishing national standards, making sure that they're future proof, and fundamentally ensuring that if, once these systems are built, they're interoperable is key. Now, um, yes, Texas is probably going to get this rule of particular applicability, which we just refer to as an RPA because the um, the language is a little bit tricky. And so if Texas gets this RPA, um, you know, look, I think it's necessary at this point um, because the, the FRA does not have uh, standards. Um, but what we're saying is that um, we need to make sure that even if we get this one-off Texas project, and, I, and I've emphasized before, I think it's important that it gets built and we need to get it built as soon as possible. Um, once, once we get that done, let's make sure that everybody else is on the same page for the standards uh, uh, going forward. And this is especially important for just fundamental um, standards like, um, like what um, electrification system that you're using um, uh, because and, and, and what signaling system uh, you're using. Um, because those are the things that are harder to change. You know, if you have some peculiarities of the rolling stock um, you know, worst case scenario, uh, we have a line that operates for the first 15, 20 years with one particular unique set of rolling stock um, that's not interoperable. Um, but at least in 20 years, we have an opportunity when that rolling stock gets renewed um, to make sure that it's broadly compatible. But we're not going to rebuild entire lines every 20 years. So we've got to make sure that the fundamental standards are, are, are agreed upon. I agree. Um, and let me know when we're out of time. Um, I really appreciate that you're taking our time to be with us. Let me know when, when uh, you want to go. We've got a lot of questions. Uh, I think we have um, about five more minutes. I will try to extend that a little bit, but I've got a very busy evening, unfortunately. Um, I hope you can tell uh, that this is fun for me. So um, I'd love to spend more time with you if I could. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and we do appreciate it. So uh, Roger has a question. Have you talked to Warren Buffett about this? Uh, good question. No, I've not talked to Warren Buffett about it. Um, I do uh, have a number of friends um, uh, at the private railroad company he owns, um, which uh, I won't name, but um, uh, I um, am in close you know, touch with different people throughout the, uh, the freight railroad industry. Um, to get different ideas on this, because I think it's important that we see them as a partner in this. And uh, historically, that's not been the case. Historically, uh, the freight railroads have been very successful as independent businesses, and they don't want to get involved and um, intertwined in more government bureaucracy, whether it's through high-speed rail or anything else. And we recognize that that no, we should be um, we should see them as potential partners. And it's not going to mean that we're going to agree on everything right off the bat, but we want to make sure we put forward a proposal that's broadly appealing. And so whether it's Warren Buffett um, uh, or other um, uh, private uh, freight railroad uh, owners, operators, and whatnot, we're trying to engage them um, as we develop this proposal further. I would argue that the, the railroads are in the process of chewing through the assets that were, that were invested in uh, decades ago. And they're actually steadily allowing their business to decline. Um, and not reinvesting. And I've, I've often argued that, that we need to figure out how to get people to think about reinvesting in the railroads again. Yeah. And, and passengers might are key to doing that. And answering the question, how can they handle high value freight and, and packages? And That's right. So uh, the, the economic term for this is that uh, freight railroads have trouble earning their cost of capital. So they have trouble earning enough revenue to continue investing in um, their capital to the extent that they can maintain it and, uh, and improve it. And um, this has been a historic economic challenge for, for freight railroads. And look, the reason it's a challenge is because their competition is subsidized. Do you think that trucking companies could earn their cost of capital if they actually had to pay for the highways? No, but they don't have to do that because they get capital for free. So this is a problem. I think that you're right. I, I believe that at some point the freight railroads will, um, will, will recognize that this could be um, an asset. And by the way, you know, companies like BNSF, Union Pacific would be really good at operating some of these trains, um, in, not just the, the passenger trains, but fast freight trains as well. Um, fast freight does not travel 
um, on, uh, on, on, on trains right now. I'm not, t I'm talking about, um, you know, the UPS does a lot of business on the freight roads, but that's not overnight business. Right. Um, but I mentioned earlier that, you know, a high speed rail trip from uh, LA to Chicago is still not fast enough that most passengers would take it. But you put a package on a train that goes all the way through overnight, and suddenly you have a way more efficient, cost effective, and by the way, much better for the environment way to get um, that Amazon delivery uh, from, Amaz from uh, LA to Chicago um, in time for the next day delivery. And that's huge. That's a massive market. Uh, that we don't talk about nearly enough. And it's a market that could benefit the freight railroads. Um, and, uh, and I hope they recognize that. And, and to bring in safety, I was a truck dispatch, uh, a dispatcher at J.B. Hunt for a number of years. Oh, I didn't know that, Rick. Uh -huh. Oh, it, and um, it was positively frightening what these team drivers would do to get that fast freight from L.A. to Chicago or even all the way to the East Coast. Yeah. And eight hours on, eight hours off, sleeping in the back of that truck. And, uh, you know, the, the, one of the worst parts of my job was dealing when a truck driver killed somebody. Yeah. And it's just, I really want to figure out how we get the railroads hauling a lot more of that faster freight. It's, a, it's a, another great example of why this is just so much better for America, right? This isn't about rail fans getting their way or whatever. This is about a system that just works much better for America. It literally will save lives. I mean, um, how much gasoline did you burn, you know, take, taking a truck from LA uh, to Chicago? Imagine if that was all electric on high speed rail. Uh, the environmental impact is just a, a fraction of what it is today. Yeah. Well, what I, we're getting at the end. So, one last question um, uh, high speed rail between New York and Boston, you hinted on it. Um, do you think we can come together and really figure out how to do high-speed rail between Boston and New York? I mean, it's insane if we can't, right? I mean, this right. is just, it's so, it's so obvious. And it's just a bunch of um, NIMBYs, not in my backyard folks, um, who don't recognize that this is a good investment for their, um, for, for their communities. And there are great historical examples, by the way, of communities that were holdouts uh, when um, they were building the interstate highway system or, or even more so when they were building um, the initial railroads. And they said, no, I don't want that in my city. And these cities basically fell off the map. Um, so anyone who has high-speed rail service will tell you, absolutely, I want to be on that line. Uh, I absolutely want that line to come right through my community. Um, not everybody in places like Greenwich, Connecticut realizes that uh, right now, which makes it, uh, which makes it more challenging. Um, but yes, I think it can get done. Um, it, we still build highways across America at the rapid weight rate, and they take way more land. By the way, create more noise pollution in addition to carbon pollution. You know, I would much rather have a high-speed rail line out behind me with a train that just whooshes by every 20 minutes and use and makes less noise than a truck. When the trucks are going by constantly. <laughs> but again, like you just need to explain this to people. They don't get it, right? So like this is frustrating, but, um, but, but that's a way better alternative. I think there's also, a, you know, one of the, I think it's very inter, um, interesting uh, proposal um, to, to come out uh, from Boston, head down through uh, Rhode Island, and then rather than fighting all these communities in Southern Connecticut, uh, just go across Long Island Sound uh, in a tunnel and right down the Long Island Railroad, which is a pretty straight right of way. And you know what? If people on Long Island are smart, they would recognize this is a huge boon for them. Because imagine being able to get from the eastern tip of Long Island into New York City in about 20 minutes on a high-speed train uh, that also goes to Boston. Um, so there are different ways I think we can make this work. Excellent. So thank you again very much for, for joining us. And thank you very much for being a champion for high-speed rail. Um, and let us know how we can help you going forward in the future. And well, uh, so. Look, Rick, you've been a champion on high-speed rail for longer than, uh, than, than I've been around here. And uh, um, I'm really grateful for your work, uh, for your organization's work. And there really are things you can do to help. So read this um, proposal, uh, you know, find out ways that you can advocate for it. 
give us feedback. Um, some great questions uh, came up today uh, that we'll take back to the team. Um, but also, you know, once you understand this proposal and believe in it, go advocate to your representatives and make sure that they sign on. That's a big way that you can help. Excellent. Thank you. And for the audience, um, if this was, thank you, you can sign off. Uh, uh, for the audience, if this was valuable to you, uh, please go to hsrail.org and up in the upper right hand corner, uh, there is a button that says donate. Uh, it seems like Zoom should be free, but it's not. So if you found this valuable, please uh, make a donation today. And, uh, and uh, the critical next step, the first step is making sure Amtrak doesn't cut service. And uh, immediately following that is uh, working on the reauthorization and getting proposals like this uh, into the next authorization. Um, and then working to ensure that that a that first line that demonstrates the case gets running. So thank you all for being here. Um, and uh, Tom, I will uh, send a link uh, to those who participated and others uh, to the Congressman's proposal. Um, for the good of the order, are there any more questions? Nope. Okay, thank you very much. Talk to you again uh, next week when we talk about how uh, commuter, expanded commuter rail and Amtrak service will be tied into uh, the Central Valley high-speed line when that operates in uh, within this decade. Thank you.